So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vanetta Lightfoot, and I am the Multicultural Affairs Operations Manager here at STCC. On behalf of the Multicultural Affairs Office, I would like to welcome you here today and thank you for participating in the kickoff of our three-part series entitled Heart of a Man, a Virtual Engaging Men series. I would like to recognize our sponsors, hashtag Stick We Can, Title IX, and our media sponsor, African American Point of View. We couldn't have done this without your support, so thank you. And now I would like to ask my colleague, Janari Merced, to come and give us some important enrollment information. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. We're super excited to have you here and to really have this conversation. Um, and um, again, I want to uh, reintroduce myself. My name is Janari Merced. I am the admissions counselor here at STCC. And um, I have to tell you, you're all in for a treat. Um, I want to start off today by just asking you why. Um, for staff and faculty that are here, um, why? Why, to, why continue to talk about STCC to your friends, family, your communities, um, and to our guests? Why? Why now is the best time to start uplifting yourself, your family, and your communities? And why do you think a college degree or certificate, and more specifically, a community college, is best for you? As you consider those whys, I want you to think a little bit about, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about why STCC and remind you about all the great things we have to offer here at STC. STCC, excuse me. <laughs> um, it's important for us to always remember that education is key, but it's what you do with that education. And here at STCC, we are devoted to developing and cultivating our students for greatness and to soar into the working environment and at four year institution. At STCC, we offer flexible schedule that are centered around our students' lives and other um, obligations. We have student supportive services that are free to all of our students, such as tutoring, um, career services, financial literacy, um, and more like TRIO and the CAS Center. We are affordable. Most of our students attend our school without ever touching um, loans. And we, are, we work diligently to make sure that our students are knowledgeable about how to borrow and making sure we're creating a path for our students to transfer and get into the work environment. We offer over 400 opportunities for students to transfer to state institutions and save thousands of dollars, such as the UMass, Westfield State, Fitchburg State, and private institutions such as AIC, Fitchburg, Western New England, um, and some others. And as you contemplate and continue to contemplate, please consider um, attending STCC. We have a great team to support you through your educational journey, and we are dedicated to supporting our students as they transform their lives. So in the chat, I'm going to leave some research for you, uh, resources for you to take a look at and to share, um, again, to the staff and faculty, share with your community as well about what we have to offer at STCC. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you all. Um, if you want to make an appointment with us at admissions, please contact us. We all have a chat feature and remember that we're here to serve, serve you and, your, and our community as well. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you, Janae. One of the goals of Heart of a Man is to promote and support the MILE Initiative for Leadership and Education, known as MILE. The MILE program is designed to provide inclusive academic support, mentoring, and community engagement opportunities to male students at STCC. MILE is currently looking for students to participate in the program. But for more information about MILE, please visit the MILE page on our website, and the link will be in the chat. Now I would like to introduce my co-creator, my colleague, and my friend, Cindy Brunig, to share more about hashtag stick we can and to introduce our moderator. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is such an honor to be here. Um, I just want to say that this series, Heart of a Man, has been an absolute labor of love um, that Vanetta, myself, James, and so many others have been dreaming and visioning um, for over uh, two years. And so um, it fills my heart and I'm so excited uh, to finally be um, 
seen uh, the result of so much, um, so much of that labor of love come to fruition today. So thank you all for being here. Um, like Benetta said, my name is Cindy Brunig and I'm project director for the Office of Violence Against Women Campus Program Grant, known as the OVW Grant. And this grant truly seeks to strengthen both prevention and response to dating and domestic violence, sexual assault and stalking. And we do this through strong campus and community partnerships, which I feel like it shows today in terms of the collaboration we've brought, um, had to bring this event forward. Hashtag Stick We Can is one initiative of that grant. And Hashtag Stick We Can really seeks to create an engaged campus community where each and every one of us knows that we can do our part to prevent sexual and relationship violence. And I believe and we deeply believe that men and those who identify as men play a critical role as leaders and allies in the work to end these forms of violence and that together we can be the change that we wanna see in the world, uh, to quote um, Gandhi. And so I am so proud to be a part of this series and uh, we hope that this is just the beginning of a long-term conversation on our campus. I would love to introduce you to our moderator for today, James Lightfoot III. James is currently the Director of Education and Youth Programs for the Urban League of Springfield. James is an advocate, a consultant, and a amazing mentor for youth young adult males and uh, programs serving that population. So I'm gonna hand it off now to you, James. Good afternoon, thank you, Cindy. Um, today's session uh, is titled, From the Heart. It will be a dialogue on healthy masculinity. Our session will feature a panel of men from diverse backgrounds, professions, and experiences who will share their stories and engage in a dialogue with participants during our Q&A. Today's panel includes a phenomenal a list of expertise, uh, experience, um, and, and, and just some really good um, individuals um, who will share their stories with you and, and inform you on some things um, as it relates to healthy masculinity. First, we have educator, author, and international speaker, M. Quentin, B.L. Williams Esquire, personal trainer and executive director of Body Image for Justice, Justice Roe Williams, staff, uh, I'm sorry, STCC faculty and department chair, Brian Candido uh, for the computer and information technology, and acclaimed writer, author, civil and human rights activist, Kevin Powell. I'm really excited to welcome all of our panelists here today and I know we're in for a very rich and meaningful uh, dialogue. But before we begin, I would like to go over the format for today's session. As you can see, we are all in webinar format. It means that your video and audio are disabled while our panelists are speaking. Please keep your video and audio off until the Q&A session begins. After we hear from our panelists, we'll transition to the Q&A portion. And you can then use the chat feature or the question and answer box to ask your questions. Please be encouraged to put questions and comments in the chat or in the Q&A box while the session is going on and our team will be monitoring it. If there are no other questions or concerns, we will begin. Ladies and gentlemen, we will start with our first question. And as I call our panelists, I will ask that they come off of uh, mute and um, show their video um, so that we can see and hear them. I'll begin with Quentin Williams. Good afternoon. Our first question we'll have for you, and thank you for joining us and coming back to STCC. Uh, thank you. How does your personal story inform what healthy masculinity is to you? Uh, it's such a great question. My personal story is one of, of challenge and those challenges were all because of the poverty that I had grown up in, having a mother who was of a different ethnicity, a different race. Um, I'm a black man 
My mother's a white Jewish woman growing up in the, during the civil rights movement. All of the challenges that, challenges that were presented were overcome because of the love of my mother. So from the very beginning, I knew that this gracious woman was going to give me something that perhaps many people on my block weren't getting. That in and of itself formed a very healthy relationship with my masculinity and with uh, my mother and women, females. This carried through uh, until I was an adult and I learned a little bit more about myself and the patriarchal society that we have. When I went to law school, I figured out that that patriarchal society created this implicit bias. And that happened because when I started to take courses at my law school, I noticed something very special. There was an, an intentional, a deliberate action by my professors to insert female females into every hypothetical we had. So those, those hypotheticals, instead of them being male-dominated hypotheticals, they were female-dominated hypotheticals. Now, this had never happened to me before. Never in the course of my history of education had I experienced this. Because we were used to, if Joe goes down to the store and trips on the curb, what happens when Joe's attorney, a male, litigates the case, as opposed to having females in that, those hypotheticals. It completely changed the way I thought about our society. It was a paradigm shift for me because I then understood that in order for us to have equality and equity, we had to be deliberate. So my law school taught me so much and it wasn't even the thing I went there to learn, but through this deliberate intentional act, every professor did this. I came out of law school thinking differently. So from now on, from then on, with every hypothetical I give people, I lead with a female. So when I talk about law enforcement community, I always use a female as the law enforcement officer. Once we do that, we shift the way society thinks culturally. And so I've been blessed. My mother gave me the foundation of love. And then through the education I received, I received opportunities to shift my mentality. Given the, the issues that society was embedding in me, the counter, the countered deliberate actions by my educators helped me to overcome societal implicit bias in essence. All right, thank you very much, Quinn. Um, and we'll have some follow-up questions during the Q&A because I'm sure you shared a lot that have people thinking. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll now hear from Justice Roe Williams. Good afternoon, Justice, and welcome again. Hi, Oh, man, how you doing? Good, good. So uh, same question as I asked uh, Quentin. So how does your personal story inform healthy inform what healthy masculinity means to you? Um, I think my personal story is unique. Um, it's unique to everyone on the panel as, you know, as a young person, I would, um, you know, you know, when we're young, we just play, we, we have joy. We don't recognize gender, right? We don't, we don't recognize things until things are really pointed out to us. 
by society, by our families, by our peers. So when things was pointed out to me, it didn't feel right. I had dysphoria in my body. I never felt connected to the body that I was in. But my experience around masculinity was unique because of the body that I grew up in and the lens that I picked up around building relationships and how I was socialized in the gender that I was seeing. So what does that mean? As a transgender male, I had a lot, a lot, a lot of challenges um, growing up in the body that society saw me in because I felt very disconnected from it. It didn't feel real life. It almost felt like the twilight zone in a way. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm 46, so I was born in like the 70s. So having conversations around gender didn't happen. Having conversations around being queer didn't really happen. You know, I grew up, I was labeled a tomboy. I rolled with it, you know what I mean? Because I got to rock and roll and do what I, I felt comfortable doing, you know what I mean? I didn't feel more separated from myself until high school where things, you know, got a little funky in the realm of, of gender and, and understanding my body. So how I navigate in this world is much differently because I'm always questioning if this is my truth. You know, trying to find, I, I've been bombarded with messages about who I am and who I'm supposed to be, what I'm supposed to look like because of other people's uncomfort. I've been bullied, I've been called names. I'm grateful for today because it was a point where, you know, my pops would say uh, this thing as a trans man, I blend. So I don't get talked about as much unless I come out, then everybody's ideologies and, and thoughts and, and what they learned about who I am, those untruths, those lies begin to come out and we see you know, what we've learned together which is not true, right? I've been bombarded with the same messages. That's why I don't inflict hate when people hate me. You know, it's hard to change the information that we receive because that grounds us, right? Gender is a grounding thing. Masculinity, therefore, is a grounding thing. And how we learn to be a man is a grounding thing, right? So realizing that there are other options is what I bring. There's other options to maleness. There's other options to masculinity. There's other options to being all of who we are without the world judging us, right? So that's how I, was, I am grounded. You know, I also think it's powerful what the speaker said ahead of me about being grounded in a mother's love because I would never be so solid. I would never be the person I am today without that grounding and understanding that's a privilege because many people don't have that privilege in their lives, a grounding in a mother's love, right? So I, I understand and recognize that my life experience is different than many people's, right? So that's who I am, that's what I bring. It says fitness for all bodies because I believe that the conversation around body image is a conversation we all need to have because that's the conversation of connectivity, right? It connects the intersections. It connects us all because we've all been lied to about who we are and who we are supposed to be and what our bodies are supposed to look like. And what does that mean to us in our lives, right? No more lies. So that's what I bring. All right, thank you very much for, for sharing that. Um, uh, you all are digging in already, you know. Um, I'm sure a lot of questions are gonna come through. So thank you very much, uh, Justice. Um, Brian Candido, uh, Professor Brian Candido. Yes, hi. Welcome, how thank are you. you? Good, how are you today? 
I'm I'm great. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us it's today. A, it's a pleasure. Uh, so same question. We're not going to throw any curveballs here. Uh, no, keep no. The, keep I got the some, message going. I got here. to hear some of the other ones, but I'm ready to go. <laughs> All right. Um, but you know your personal story, right? So how does your personal story inform what healthy masculinity is to you? Sure. So there's some back backstory I have to share. So um, I I'm one. I'm the youngest of six kids, two immigrants parents. Um, so lived in 16 acres in Springfield, and I actually graduated from Stick, and I run the department now that I graduated from, and that made all the world of opportunity available to me. But I had a very traditional 50s, 60s upbringing. You know, mom stayed home, dad worked two, three jobs doing construction, the manly things. He was a tank commander in the military, so we heard a lot about discipline and taking care of yourself and helping others out and respect to women. I had three sisters who are lovely, but also drove me crazy at different times. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has sisters, but so, but um, when I was four years old, I had a lawnmower accident and a uh, lawnmower ran over my foot and I had to learn to walk. And that was my first um, lesson in being stoic. Like, okay, you're missing part of your foot. You're gonna have to just, you know, man up, do what you need to do, learn to walk and do these things. So I got love you know, and I got support, but it was like, no time for crying. You got to make this stuff happen. I'm thankful to my mom who took me to the Shriner so I could learn to walk again without a limp. And then I got into sports and then actually into Taekwondo where I got a black belt, um, even though I was missing part of my foot, which was quite challenging. And the first time I actually questioned any of the gender roles I ever been exposed to was in fourth grade when I had my first male teacher. Um, I never knew a male could be a teacher. I've always had women who are wonderful, had great experience, but I never thought. And that got me looking at things a little different. And then yep, I went to stick and then I got married and uh, had a family. And I found myself, even though I was very open-minded in the very stereotypical upbringing I had. I worked, my ex went to, uh, stayed home with the children. And then something happened where I become, became a single parent. And then suddenly I had to take on the cooking and the laundry stuff I never had to do because my mom and my sisters did. And I, I couldn't order McDonald's and pizzas for the kids every night. So I said, I'm going to have to learn how to do this cooking thing. So, so I had to evolve and I had to change. And, and I guess I continue to do so. I think that um, I certainly, my arc of change has been a lot. And I like to think that I'm still heading in the right direction, taking all the good stuff that I liked and building upon and stuff that I, I feel um, I don't believe in or I think is old fashioned, I kind of put to the side or maybe it's a, a point to talk about. And um, I remember one comment I got when my son, who's now 24, I took him to a birthday party and it was the only um, dad there, it was all moms. And then they said to me, I wish my husband would come to the party. And they didn't understand I had no choice. My kid would not come to the party if I didn't bring him. And then Later at the end, several of the moms were uh, complaining to their husbands that, you know, like what I do, I bring the kids to the party, I bring them roller skating. And then they started to give me some attitude because they said I was making their life harder and I didn't really understand that. So, and the other thing too was at six, I realized I was very different than the others. I realized I was attracted to men and women. And like Justice shared, we didn't talk about such things, but I did know it wasn't a cool thing to do. And uh, especially at that time, my family was very structured. So just people didn't talk about that. And there was no internet. There was no place to talk about these things. So it was, it was a challenge. It was a challenge. And then I found that, you know, uh, when I was in Taekwondo, I would break more boards than some of the other people. Maybe I was trying to overcompensate or prove something. But that was only to myself. And, and Justice also said that sometimes, uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, he used the word passable. People don't guess. People don't don't you know? read between the lines, but there's a lot more richness to us than just what you see. There's more to our background and that makes us up. I like to think that every day I'm becoming better and changing and building on what I've done. And um, so I actually like where I'm at life and I like the direction I'm heading in. And like I said earlier, I'm taking what I thought was good values and I'm building upon them. So I think I'll leave it at that. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Um, it will present some, some further conversation for us um, as we move along. Um, all right, so let's hear from uh, Mr. Kevin Powell. 
Um, hey, good brother. How are you? Good. Hey, everyone. Good. Uh, I I'm ex I'm excited and honored to be here. I want to thank um, Mr. and Miss Mrs. Lightfoot for uh, giving me the opportunity. Um, in Springfield uh, Technical Community College, it's great to be back connected with you all after being there in person a few years back. I was just really um, moved by everyone who just spoke, uh, the honesty and the power of the different stories. And I'll just add a few things here, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation with everyone. Um, manhood. Um, my introduction to manhood was both my mother and my father. Uh, I was raised by a single mother on welfare, food stamps, government cheese, and the kind of poverty I wouldn't wish on anyone. Um, I only saw my father, who was not married to my mother. He, he was about 11, 12 years older than her. I only saw him two or three times between the time I was born and eight years old. Um, he only came around when my mother asked or begged you know, for some support. He bought me a watch, bought me a bicycle. Uh, I spent a little bit of time with him in his truck. He was a truck driver. I spent a little bit of time in his house and that was the extent of it. When I was eight years old, my father, uh, we were so poor, we didn't have a phone in the house. We had to, back then there was no cell phones. We had to actually go to um, the local drugstore where there was pay phones, you know, uh, phone booths as they called them back then. And it was a rainy day and my mother was asking my father yet again, can you help us, can I, you help us? And on this particular day, when I was eight years old, my father said to my mother, she would share with me later. And I could tell as she was talking, her body language, how much what he was saying was affecting her. Uh, he said, You're, he's, you lied to me. He's not my son. I'm not gonna give you a near nickel for him ever again. He didn't just say a nickel, he said a near nickel. I didn't even know what that was. Um, to put it in context, my mother's from the South, from South Carolina, my father's from a different part of South Carolina. So it was obviously some sort of phrasing that he had grown up with. My mother was devastated, I was devastated. And two things I remember my mother said to me from that point on, do not be like your father. And if I ever misbehaved in any way, you're just like your father. You can imagine the schizophrenia, the confusion I had as a boy, as a teenager, you know, should I not be like my father or am I actually like my father? I also need to say as a heterosexual male, a cisgender male, you know, I grew up doing boy, so-called boy things, you know, wearing boy colors. Um, this is what boys did, this is what girls did, uh, playing sports. And, but, um, you know, I wasn't one of those kids who actually had a coach and I played baseball for years. I ran track cross country all four years in high school. It's just, it was just playing sports. There are great coaches out there, we know that, who actually become mentors and role models for the young men and help them to navigate manhood. I did not have a single positive male influence until I was 18 years old on a financial aid package at Rutgers University in my home state of New Jersey. Uh, not the pastors of our churches, uh, not the men in the community, uh, not my coaches, no one, no one at all. What I remember in terms of my mother with men is that a lot of the men simply wanted to exploit and use her. They saw women, I would think, realized later on in life as a couple of different things, mother figures or caretakers, sexual objects, or we're talking about Domestic Violence Awareness Month, October, punching bags. That's how people like my mother were viewed. I also know growing up, as I'm listening to the other stories, I was an A student K through 12. My mother did not tolerate bad grades. My mother had a great school education, but she pushed me hard to take education seriously because she felt that education was the ticket to me having a better life than what she had had. Poverty, and poverty as we know is a form of violence. Well, the education was excellent in certain ways, but when I think back on it now, as we talk about manhood, we need to be honest about the fact that pretty much all of us are grossly miseducated about manhood and masculinity right in school, right in our families, right in our communities, right in our churches, synagogues, masjids. What do I mean? If you go to school K through 12, doesn't matter if it's public schools or private schools, it absolutely doesn't matter. Just like it's horrific that you could learn nothing about, Af about Black people, Latinx people, Asian people, Native American people, Middle Eastern people. I learned K through 12, Betsy Ross sold a flag. I learned about Rosa Parks not giving up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. 
I may have heard vaguely about Madame Curie and Helen Keller and, and, and Harriet Tubman. And that was the totality of my education around women, K through 12, which is 13 years. What does that mean for us as those of us who identify as men, boys, males? In grade school, it was not uncommon for us in the third or fourth grade, young boys to run around the school and grab the body parts of girls as if it was no big deal, not realizing, understanding, because no one ever said anything to us that that is actually called sexual assault. What does that mean? If you don't learn about the contributions of women and girls equally to math, to science, to history, to literature, to the arts, to inventions across the board, if all you learn over and over again is that men, men, men were the explorers, the founders of this country, quote unquote, the heroes of everything, you'll start to believe at a very early age, whether you're a straight male, a gay male, a bisexual male, a transgender male, who's not fully woke, you will really believe that men are superior to women and girls. And if you believe that men and women, men are superior to women and girls, it means that you will engage in some form of violence toward women and girls in your lifetime. I'm not just talking about physical violence, rape, sexual assault, hitting, punching, kicking, stabbing, shooting, murdering, which we know are horrific acts of violence against women and girls. I'm also talking about, if we're talking about women, grown women who are 18 years of age and older, but constantly referring to them as girls. As one of our other uh, panelists said, what do we mean by, what do I mean by that? Constantly always saying he, he, he for everything as if women and girls don't even exist. What do I mean by that? You know, thinking that it's okay, as I thought at certain points in my life to only see girls as sexual, women as girls when I was a kid, but women when I got to college as sexual objects. What does it mean? By the time I was a young man, 24 years old, out of college, I pushed a girlfriend into a bathroom door because she said something that I didn't like. This is in the early 1990s, in the early 1990s. What does it mean? It means that I had to not only be challenged by women in my community, but also men in my community as a young man in my 20s, that it is unacceptable, unacceptable in any form to do anything that harms a woman or a girl. What did that mean for me when we talk about manhood? It meant that I had to go back to therapy and really unpack, well, where did you learn this violent behavior from? Where did it come from? And the reality is it came from how I was educated around manhood, my family, my community, my education, mass media culture, film, TV, music, everything is slanted toward men and boys. And it, mean, it meant that I had to take ownership for my behavior. It meant I haven't even had to go back and think about Justice and Brian, not only my sexism, let's call it what it is because it's called sexism, but let me also think about homophobia and transphobia, you know, the dissing of men who may be different than me, which is what a lot of us do. You know, the kind of things we even said to each other as children that became the things that we see, say to each other as adults. And so all of it, forced me to come to a reckoning in the 90s as I was working for Vibe Magazine, Quincy Jones's Vibe Magazine, and documenting the biggest rappers of the day, including Tupac Shakur, many times. And realizing that even our culture, hip hop, rock and roll, jazz, it doesn't matter, they're all the same, have all been so male dominated that women are seen as mother figures or caretakers, sexual objects, or punching bags. And so for me, my journey, um, Mr. Lightfoot, has been to be brutally honest, to be transparent, to take ownership for my behavior, but also to understand that the re-education has to come from me. How was it that I could go through life and not consider reading Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and Bell Hooks and Eve Ensler, who now, go, now goes by V, Gloria Steinem, Susan Sontag, Audre Lorde, Nikki Giovanni, a range of women, so I could begin to understand half this country's population and half the world's population. And so, and that what that did to me was understand, make me understand that I was a beneficiary of something we call male privilege, which means I don't have to think about certain things because I'm a man. You know, I go running or jogging as I did this morning on a trail hiking. I don't have to think about my safety because I'm a male, but imagine how women feel when they're out there th thinking that something could happen to them because of a male who participates in toxic manhood, thinking that they can just do anything to a woman who's out there jogging or walking or hiking. And so that's the work that I've been doing for the last 25 plus years as an activist 
uh, not just against racism, white supremacy, but also against patriarchy, sexism, homophobia, transphobia. Um, you know, it, it hurt my heart to hear the things that Justice was talking about because so many of us remain unwoke and very clueless and very ignorant. Uh, and we don't realize that most of us, Americans worldwide, doesn't matter who we are, live in this box. It's like a male prison where we think being a man means being you know, aggressive and violent and competitive and egotistical and that men don't cry. These all things, all these things leave you in what I call, what we call the male prison. And that's my work to get out of that male prison and help any of us get out of that male prison where we can respect each other and a diversity of masculinity that we see on this brilliant panel, no matter where we are. Excellent, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and I've been crafting uh, some, some thoughts or questions that I like to bring up um, during our uh, Q and A. Um, but thank you uh, all um, for sharing your personal stories with us um, and giving us a little insight on how you've become um, the, the men, the individuals, the strong leaders uh, that you are today. All right, so for our next question or next set of questions, um, I would like for us to engage in a dialogue uh, amongst one another. Um, so um, we'd like to see everyone, um, our panel, um, you know, with your video on. Um, and as you hear the questions um, that I present, uh, feel free to, you know, jump in and answer. Um, hopefully we, we all can handle this uh, floor and not talk over one another, but you know, contribute um, as you see fit, all right? So, pull up my questions here. All right, so it, there's a lot of talk around mothers here, and this is not one of our questions. I'm just trying to preface it so that um, we can get deeper into it. Um, and, and mothers provide many of us with our strength and understanding um, and, and how we, you know, show different emotions and uh, mannerisms. So how do you show strength? Uh, and then how do you show vulnerability? Would you like to choose and, somebody and, or should and, I start? <laughs> and you can kick it off if you like. Okay. Well, those two words, vulnerability and strength, they go together. Usually we associate in society vulnerability as a weakness with weakness, but actually it's a strength. The way I express vulnerability is simply through my story. Um, my story is that I grew up in poverty, much like Kevin, um, on welfare for the first 17 years of my life, raised by a, a white Jewish woman who raised me in the middle of the, the civil rights movement, just post civil rights movement. And so all of those challenges that came from society were associated with the, my mother being a white woman. I wasn't accepted. And then when I was in the third grade, I learned that I couldn't really read. I couldn't read like my friends were reading. I have, I have a deficit that I overcame, but for the first 20 something years of my life, I couldn't put words together the way my friends could put words together. Mm -hmm. So it had to be all effort, four times the effort just to get one half the result. I hid this from society for 40 years. My closest friends, my family didn't know that I had this reading issue. My closest friends didn't know I was on welfare for the first 17 years of my life. And that was a burden that I carried with me for 40 years years until one day I was very deliberate about this one day I said I'm no longer going to live with this shame I'm no longer going to live with this weight because the weight was affecting every relationship I had and so I'd made the decision that I was just going to be transparent I was going to tell my story I was going to release myself from this shame that had entrapped me and that's what I did and once I started, I couldn't stop. And maybe there's too much information that I give people now, but when I when asked to speak on these subjects, for example, at my law school, I was asked to speak to a group of 300 prospective law students. I told my story and here's what was so important about it. After I told my story, 
I had a young Latina woman come up to me and she was a prospective student. She was one of the top students in the state. And she approached me and said, Mr. Williams, your story is my story. I'm on welfare. My family's been on welfare for our whole lives. And I'm so ashamed. I've been living with this shame for 21 years. I'm a 4.0 student. I've done everything what everything right. But this shame, it's entangling me until now. Because you just gave me permission to tell my story. You just told me it's okay to have this kind of a journey. So now I'm gonna tell everybody. I'm I'm releasing myself from the shame. I'm free, she said. And I said, that's what it's all about. I knew there was a reason why God brought me to that point. That was it. It wasn't about me. It was about how could I help somebody else? And that served as an example of how my vulnerability, my pain together served as a strength that strengthened somebody else. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, any other any other of our panelists want to respond? Um, or please do respond to that, how you show uh, strength and how you show vulnerability. I think building on what Quentin said is to release yourself and be honest and transparent. I mean, for for a good part of my life, I kept part of it to myself, like we all did, different, different aspects of it. And then I feel like I wasn't being my true legitimate self, right? And that stopped me from filtering i'd filter some stuff people say right if you're hanging out with your friends having a beer and looking at a football game you like talk one way right and then say just say you're watching rupaul or something with someone else and you'd be maybe behaving a different way and it's like why why do i have to flex up or down why can't i just be myself so so isn't it crazy it takes you to a certain point in your life to say why am i doing this this is crazy i should just be me and if people like me or they don't i'm just gonna be my authentic self and let let it come through and um, like some of the stuff I shared just like a short while ago, I would never have considered sharing before. But I think putting yourself out there and having that dialogue and letting other young students or other people or males in the community or male people who identify as male to say, I'm not the only one who feels this way. There is someone else like me. I don't feel alone anymore. So I think being our authentic self. And I also learned, especially being in the classroom with many students, it's okay to, to say, I don't know or I was wrong about that, but I'll get back to you once I fully understand how to solve that. There is so much, I feel men, you know, like I remember my dad would be driving around and not ask for directions. I mean, and my mom would say, pull over and ask, oh no, no, we'll get there, right? And I think we brute force through things, some men, right? That, because we can't ask for help. I mean, I can, that's before navigation, obviously, but you know, he's 92 and he still doesn't want to use his navigation. But you know, it's, 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 it's that, it's like, it's okay to ask for help, right? And I tend to take on way too much at the house and not delegate because I'm the male authority and I can do it right. I rearrange the dishwasher because it's not efficiently done. Who cares if it needs a rerun twice? Let them do it and empower them. That's what I say. Hmm. Um, I, Kevin, uh, looks like you're ready. Yeah. yeah, you were saying vulnerability and strength, is that right? I, I Correct. Mean, what everyone else said, you know, we just, men are socialized in this country, United States of America, which is what I know best. And I've traveled around the world, um, not to speak, not to express emotions. Uh, you call it weak. You're called all kinds of homophobic and transphobic stuff. If you do show any emotions. Um, I remember early this year, the football player, Dak Prescott, his brother, Dak Prescott with the Dallas Cowboys, his brother committed suicide. Dak expressed his emotions. And there was this barrage of, of sports uh, casters and sports writers dissing him and his quote unquote manhood and that he just needed to toughen up. It's absolutely insane. You know, it's insane behavior. Here I was growing up, you know, and in, as we talked about earlier, uh, the poverty and, 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 you know, being told that I can't cry, I can't express myself. I, I mean, I played sports, I fought all the time because that's what we were supposed to do as boys, you have to fight. Uh, even if we're literally killing each other, you know, and things that I actually loved as well, like writing poetry or writing in general and reading books, I had to suppress or the love of the arts 
because there was something wrong with you as a boy if you happen to be into all those things. And so what we don't realize when we talk about vulnerability and strength, part of vulnerability and strength is actually being a whole human being. You know, I'm listening to Brother Brian talk about, you know, here's the football game and here's RuPaul. Well, why can't you like both? You know what I'm saying? But if we're in the male prison, then you you believe that you can't express yourself. I mean, now I don't care what people think. I'm like, whatever. And I agree. I mean, as a writer, I've written 14 books. One of my books is my autobiography where I just lay it all out. It's called The Education of Kevin Powell. The subtitle is A Boy's Journey into Manhood because I'm like, I want to be like Alice Walker. I want to be like Toni Morrison. I want to be an honest human being. I want to be like Bell Hooks. I want to be an honest human being. What have I gotten from women studying and learning about women? They talk about things. What have I also gotten from women? Learn how to listen, you know? And I think that's actually a form of vulnerability and strength, you know? And so when I hear uh, folks like Justice and Brian speaking and Quentin, you know, I appreciate all the stories because it's like, we don't grow as men, quote unquote, if we're not willing to hear, hear ourselves and hear each other and, and to be able to respect what differences we may have. Uh, I will say this, um, and I'll end it here, vulnerability and strength, and I'm saying this as someone who used to be a big old, you know, patriotic flag waver. It's not the definition of, of manhood that we've been given in this country. I can tell you that much. Manhood is not dropping bombs on people. My, manhood is not having unnecessary war after, after unnecessary war. Manhood is not, you know, uh, uh, condemning people who happen to be, you know, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender in the military and telling them they're banned from the military if they want to serve in the military. Manhood is not you know, constantly wounding and damaging people. Manhood is not what happened to Dr. King with the FBI, where they were constantly kind of undermining his manhood as they were wiretapping him all along, this man of peace who had some contradictions, but their definition of manhood was, we're going to exploit and, and abuse and sensationalize and denigrate this man because we don't like his politics. That's not manhood. That's called evil, toxic manhood, you know? And so I just need to put that out there because when we look at the history of our country, it's a lot of examples of greatness, but there's also a lot of examples of the very toxic manhood that all of us participated in. We gotta stop thinking that Donald Trump is some sort of new phenomenon. Actually, he's no different than Christopher Columbus, some of the so-called founding fathers and a whole bunch of men all through history, including pre previous presidents of the United States. You don't think so? Look up President Andrew Jackson and what he did and then compare what Donald Trump is doing is actually the same exact stuff. This is not new. And so part of the vulnerability and strength to me also, if we're talking about redefining manhood away from toxic masculinity, is we actually need to know American history. Most of us do not. We make up stuff, we freelance stuff, but many of us don't even know basic American history, where this stuff came from. I'm listening to Justice talk about the body, the body, the body. Well, slavery itself was toxic manhood because of the exploitation of black bodies. The genocide of Native Americans is toxic manhood because of what happened to them in the name of manhood, explorers, conquerors. And so this is not some new phenomenon we're talking about. This is something that is deeply embedded in the DNA of this country, which is why something like the feminist movement or the gay rights movement came along in the first place because they were like, enough. This is destructive to all of us. It ain't just Donald Trump, y'all. Excellent, thank you. Justice, would you like to share or? If not, we have more. And it's like, that was the wrap up, man. What you, <laughs> what you need me to bring after that? That was like on point. Um, one of the, the things that, you know, I, I like, uh, I, I read a lot of bell hooks as well, mm. you know. Um, That's right. Matter of fact, a lot of my training with men around healthy masculinity incorporates a lot of bell hooks, a lot of Audre Lorde, mm. a lot of uh, not your usual suspects. One time I got yelled at on Facebook. It was, it was funny. Uh, I said, you know, it takes a woman to teach a man how to be a man, right? And I'm not taking away the experience of learning manhood and masculinity from our fathers, from our brothers, right? But in some way, acknowledging that it's tainted by white supremacist patriarchal culture, right? And, and once we acknowledge that, then we have to open our minds from our taintedness. 
That's right. and learn from those who have been affected by how we are viewed in the world. Yeah. So I feel as though wherever I go, you know, I, like everyone else, I believe my vulnerability is my greatest strength, my ability to be my whole self everywhere I go, right? And to really combat this ideology that we believe about masculinity and, and not really identify how we are hungry for this power, even as black men trying to find ourselves in a world of oppression, right? And really listening and learning not only from our hearts, but the heart of a woman, right? So I incorporate all that because then I'm allowed to have emotions. Then I'm allowed to have real conversations about myself. Then I'm not seen in such an abusive lens. I'm not seen in this toxicity that, that we have been bombarded in our mindset about who we are. Yeah, I'm just viewed in love. And so that's what I want to create that as an option for us to be viewed in love, to be seen as our whole selves, you know, and I find that what is not what is what is similar in all of our stories is this ability to want to be seen as our whole selves, as all of who we are, not this diminished notion that we've been fed and force fed, not just us but everyone around us with their expectations about who we should be as a man, as a black man, media, our peers, our friends, our family, our mothers, our fathers at time, we all learn the same thing. Yeah. And so we have to navigate and communicate and work this together. You know, when I talk about, I come out everywhere and I work in a very, um, Hyper masculine in industry. I work in the fitness industry. I work in an industry that force feeds us ideas about athleticism, about what our bodies should look like, what is these norms, right? About accessibility, about what it looks like to be strong, right? I'm working in this very toxic <laughs> field. And what I want to do is I want to bring some truth to it. I want to bring truth to the lies that we are learning about ourselves in our bodies, right? So my vulnerability is to be able to come out and speak truth to power about who I am. I don't hide. I don't hide about how I was born, about my experience, about my truths, because I feel like hiding, right, is part of that toxic world we live in. You know, I learned as a child that Whatever happens in the house stays in the house. So that's where the, the secrets begin, right? So not really sharing all of these things about what's going on with me internally, right? Because that's not normal. So my greatest strength is my vulnerability. That is my greatest strength. To yeah. be able to provide that as an option in any circle that I'm a part of. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this is dope. <laughs> just as it's dope, Kevin says. You heard me just uh, he may have put you back on mute. Well, we'll let make sure he gets his shout out. Um, Kevin, you started this off um, kind of transitioning us. Um, just as picked it up. So we're going to um, go along into our second um, question here. It's, a, it's about this um, tox toxic masculinity. Right. Um, why do you think it's so difficult for men to recognize it um, and to deal with it? And that's not just pointed at, you know, Kevin and Justice. They did, you know, uh, throw up the alley-oop for us to begin the conversation. Uh, I love the sports metaphors, the sports head thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, you know, I do workshops like Justice um, does. I, I do workshops with men and boys all around the country and globally. Um, it's just like white supremacy, racism with white brothers and sisters, white folks, no matter what their gender identity or if they're non-gender conforming. Um, when you're confronted with, with, you know, white supremacy, with racism, you've benefited from white supremacy, from racism because of your skin color. People become terrified because they think they have to give up something. 
You know, so this is massive pushback. This is how Donald Trump and the right wing and the Republican Party has ascended to power since the days of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, when he got elected in 1980, this did not start with Donald Trump. Please know our history, please. And so they have benefited from putting forth the notion that someone is trying to take something back from them. Therefore, we need to make America great again. Where the same thing applies to sexism, to patriarchy, to misogyny, to toxic manhood. Many of us who have been socialized as males or who can call ourselves males or men believe that, you know, somehow or another, women of all backgrounds or gay men or bisexual men or transgender men are somehow going to be taking something away from us. And therefore, it is about power because. You know, what is homophobia? It's about sexual identity, gender identity, and power. What is sexism? It's sex, your gender, plus power. Just like racism is race plus power. You know what I'm saying? It's all the same thing. And so what I always say to men and boys is what, rather than looking at something that you, you're losing, what I, if I can bring it back to my own personal thing, what I realized is that as I was reading Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, Nikki Giovanni, Eve Insler, who knows now goes by V's, Gloria Steinem, all these amazing women, I was actually not losing anything at all, but gaining one, a deeper sense of my own humanity, a love for the human race, because there really is only one human race. All this other stuff around race and all that madness is construct, as we know. And I also realized I was getting a different definition of manhood coming my way. Hey, Kevin Powell, What's wrong if your definition of manhood is rooted in nonviolence and love and peace? You know, justice said it, love and peace. What's wrong if your definition of manhood is rooted in kindness and, and compassion and empathy, actually caring about people, no matter who they are? What's wrong if your definition of manhood does not support war, does not support a narrative in terms of our education where everything is about conquering and exploring people, but actually talks about the contributions of all people equally, as equals, as equals, as equals. What's wrong if your definition of manhood may include, yep, I love sports, but I also love the opera and I love ballet and I love all kinds of stuff. What's wrong with that, you know? And so I think that, you know, part of it is that we have got to be willing to redefine manhood in a way that is actually healthy. Because if you don't participate in a healthy definition, you will be for the rest of your life, a toxic man. There's no other way to say it. And I also believe that there's a difference between a male and a man. A male is those of us who have a certain kind of ideological viewpoint in the world, we identify as males. But I think that manhood means that I'm actually going to take ownership for my behavior, I'm gonna change some things. I'm gonna redefine some things. I'm gonna question some things. I'm gonna question things that I've been taught, you know? And I'm gonna change this in a way, I want my definition of manhood to be something that actually is about life instead of death. And what do I mean by that? As a heterosexual, cisgender man, it means that I should not kill people based on my definition of manhood. That means straight folks, queer folks, transgender folks, transgender women, you know what I mean? People who are color, immigrants, we can go right down the list, you know what I mean? What does that mean as a man who's trying to be healthy? I might wanna be honest about the history that I come out of. It's been a history of torture and violence. I need to go in a different direction here. And so that's what I think about, you know? But I think what it means is that we have to be willing to open ourselves up to be transformed. There's two great examples of that, of men that I wanna just throw out there to folks. Malcolm X, read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Malcolm had many imperfections, many mistakes. We don't know what he could have been because he was killed at 39, but what we do see with Malcolm X, he constantly was changing and questioning. Bobby Kennedy, the last four years of his life, after his brother John was killed, the President of the United States, he was constantly and changing and evolving. Read the autobiography of Malcolm X cover to cover, go back, go to YouTube, Bobby Kennedy's speech on April 4th, 68, when Dr. King is killed, listen to this white brother who comes from a family of privilege, talk about what he talk about Dr. King and what he had evolved into as a man. Those are two examples I think that shows what's possible. And then I want to throw out, you know, our dear brother James Baldwin, James Baldwin, James Baldwin. Just read the fire next time. Just read the fire next time. It's very short. This is a gay black man from Harlem who taught me more about manhood than most straight men will ever teach me. I think for me why um that's a tough that's tough to follow after but I love that was very important and um, very powerful but for me why I feel it was difficult for me to hear the toxic masculinity was because I heard it from people that loved me right people would say stuff to me that loved me mm -hmm. and I wouldn't question them because they love me so they must be looking out for me um, two things one I already shared like after my lawnmower accident it was like don't cry just get up and walk you know which I I, I appreciate that like 
get up and go can do attitude, but there was a time to kind of let me process that I'm missing part of my foot and this and that. So then I, so I did focus on the end result, which I did get there, but it wasn't an easy journey. And I remember at my 10th, it was my birthday and it was my 10th mm -hmm. birthday. And I wanted to something, I had some friends over and I wanted to either have the cake at a certain time or whatever. And someone um, it was my mom and she was a very lovely person, but she said in front of my friends, you you sound like a girl, stop whining. And all I was like, I, yeah. she might as well just slap me across the face in front wow. of my friends. So whenever I talked after that, or I went to Taekwondo practice, I was like, am I kicking like a girl? Am I not hitting hard enough? You know, so these are the people who love me and I know they love me, but if they were saying these things to me, there was like, like affirmation that they must be right. And I shouldn't question that. So for me, it took a long time to unbundle and peel back the layers of that to say that was, she was probably stressed. She was tired and probably didn't want to deal with a birthday party on that day with six kids, but I took it a totally different way. And that's why I, I found myself saying some of that stuff, you know, like when my mm -hmm. son, when I was a single parent and I was stressed and I was working and trying to feed them. And I said something similar to that. And I caught myself and I said to him, I was wrong to say that to you. And you can sound any way you want any time of the day. So, but it took me what, 20 something years to get to that point. And, uh, wow. Wow. and so that's, for me, that's where it came from because people I love said stuff to me and then I took it really to heart and it took a long time to undo that. I wish life just had an undo switch just like in software, but we don't. But we can learn from these things as long as we take ownership for it. You exactly. know, we all make mistakes. The key thing is not to make the same mistakes over and over again. Absolutely. And yeah. I agree with that. True. All right, Quentin, you came up. I, I, I want to say something. Sure. I, yeah, I was going to oh. say I wanted to Go say ahead, something. Well, Go ahead, Justice. Go ahead, Justice. Go ahead, Justice. Oh, oh, thank you so much. I just wanted to highlight the idea around power, um, around the we don't we don't recognize that it's a lot larger, right? Because it's systemic, right? When I'm talking about. Uh, a white supremacist patriarchal culture in relationship to what happens to me as a black man in the systems that I walk through daily. And that's uh, education and that's uh, healthcare and that's our government, right? And I think about, you know, being masculated like over and over and over again through these systems, not being you know, taken seriously, not my power being diminished and diminished and diminished because of oppression, right? Mm -hmm. And so the only feel of power I have is the crumbs that are given much like slavery, wow. right? So I feel powerful in this idea of what masculinity or what manhood brings to my life, right? So it's larger, I, I want us to look at the, the onion that we are unveiling right now, yeah. right? It's not as simple as saying power, but understanding what happens in a system where we are invisible and not seen. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm. Say it. Yep. So Thank you, Justice. I, Cute. I, and I, so I look at this in, um, I make the analogy of warrior versus guardian do a lot of law enforcement work with communities and and I, I think it is analogous in many ways we're conditioned uh, to be warriors by society and implicit in that is that we don't have love <laughs> we emotion it's not it's not we're not conditioned to have that. We're born with it, but then we're reconditioned. Exactly. And and so because of that, as as that reconditioning takes takes place, anything that threatens it gives us this feeling of insecurity. And so now we're insecure. And that just in in essence, it furthers or it accelerates the issues that we see. So now if if I'm if I'm feeling like I want to express emotion, 
or I want to love, I have, I've been reconditioned not to. I've been reconditioned to be a warrior. When I see something that, when I see somebody who does express that, as Brian's talking about, you know, he, he likes the arts. When, when, when I see that, that threatens my masculinity. I've been reconditioned. So that's a threat. So I see, I see this in that, in those terms that we, we're reconditioned, we're, we are born with love. We're born to give love, but we're reconditioned by society to be these warriors. And so anything that threatens that, we push back against, unless, here's a big unless, unless you have not been reconditioned. And that's what, I, my mother re, did not recondition me. My mother was uh, and is, she's still alive, I'm so blessed. She, she brought everybody into our village. We love everybody as kids. So when my brother and I, now who are now, we're adults, we carried that into our adulthood and we love everybody. No reconditioning. That's what we, it's our responsibility to do this for our next generations, not to recondition them. They are born with love. Everyone is born with this love, with this emotion, with vulnerability. So let's allow them to be that way. Huh. Let's allow them to be that way. Can I, can I say one quick thing? Um, you know, I think what, what Brother Quinn is saying is so important because love, love is often absent from the conversations. Um, but I also agree with Brother Justice, which is we've got to talk about the power dynamic, the power structures, because the, the purpose of corrupt, evil, toxic power and toxic manhood is not to have love, is to have hate and to fight, pit us against each other. You know, straight folks over here, queer folks over there, white over here, black over there, American citizens versus immigrants, male versus female. Y'all know what I'm talking about working class people versus working class people just because they're different races. And so they, it's, not either, it's not actually an either or, it's both. We need to diagnose and fight against corrupt power that's not really about we the people, because it's not. And we also need a movement that is rooted in love because otherwise, to Justice's point, you will just replace oppression with more oppression. You know. I can say as a black man, a heterosexual black man, the worst thing that I could do is be out there talking about Black Lives Matter then turn around and be homophobic, transphobic, or sexist. You know what I mean? Where's the love at? Because the love also, to Quentin's point, has to be consistent. You can't just love when you feel like it. Either you love people or you don't. And just like you can't say you're anti-oppression, I mean, if you're really anti-oppression, then you gotta be opposed to all forms of oppression, not just what's convenient for you, like, I mean, it can't just be people of color, black folks talking about racism, and white supremacy, white folks got to talk about it. It can't just be women talking about toxic manhood, men got to talk about it. It can't just be queer folks, the LGBT plus community talking about homophobia, transphobia, straight folks got to talk about it. It can't just be poor people talking about poverty, it's got to be wealthy folks talking about it and right on down the line. Otherwise, nothing changes and we just kind of go in circles in what Malcolm X called a very vicious cycle. I'm not with cycles, I'm with forward progress. That's what we need in this country and on this planet, forward progress. Thank you, Kevin. Keep presenting that platform for us, brother. Um, and so our final question uh, this afternoon before we open up to our uh, audience here, um, and I'm just gonna say it, where's the love, right? Um, uh, what uh, supports, <laughs> yeah, you started it quit. perfectly. <laughs> so where is the love? So what supports are or should be available to men um, who are seeking spaces to vent or to understand, um, you know, these this idea that we're talking about today of healthy masculinity. Like, where do where do men go, or where do people go to find out more, to to have a space, um, and to be their true self or whole self, as has been stated. So I like, um, I'm gonna jump on and, and talk a little bit about the project that I'm, I'm working on. Um, it's really interesting. I uh, 
facilitated a workshop um, in Western Mass, um, in, which is one, one of the reasons why I'm here as well. And um, for Jane Doe, and um, it, it landed me a job. So first and foremost, the joke is, is like jobs usually don't come easy to me. <laughs> so I'm just like, when the person was like, yo, I'm going to give you a job, homie, blah, 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 blah. I was like, yeah, right, whatever. And then <laughs> when, so joke over, when I moved to Boston, they was like, yo, um, are you going to apply for this position? Da, da, da. And I was like, now this is serious. And the position is basically working or organizing barbers where we are um, kind of changing the culture in the barbershop where the barbers become leaders and mentors and what healthy masculinity looks like. They become facilitators of a more positive influence conversation. So it's really um, having spaces like that or creating spaces. And I love intergenerational conversations where, where intergeneral conversations can happen. And so the barbershop is like the perfect spot. It's, it's where boys become men. You know, you go get your, your first, you know, haircut. If you, you're not like me, you get it all tight <laughs> on the sides and whatnot. So you gotta go in and get somebody with two hands to do that. You know, I can just zip it off. But, you know, it's, it's really transforming the conversations we have with each other and how we engage with each other and how we're modeling what healthy transport, what healthy masculinity looks like, right? Mm -hmm. And that model needs to, to be consistent, but also that model is allowed to have mistakes happen, right? So it's like, because we all have egos, everyone wants to not make a mistake, but change happens when we make those mistakes because we then realize that we're all fed the same information. So it means that we always have to be questioning ourselves. Change happens within first, and then it, it goes without, you know, with, with everyone. And so I, I really feel like having conversation is the meat of creating this change, right? In ways where we're allowed to make mistakes, where mistakes happens and we're not judged, where we can look within ourselves and learn right? It's not like PowerPoint and you are the enemy, right? We already feel that shit every day. Excuse my French, I'm sorry. We <laughs> already feel that every day. It's like a micro, you know, that just hangs out. We feel that every day. So we want to be able to have spaces where we can express ourselves without judgment, right? And be more open, be open-minded, right? Because someone's going to definitely question our roots, our foundation, our framework, right? What we've learned and allow that to seep in so something new can grow. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, excellent. Good, good stuff. Yep. So yeah, I, I, I think what we're talking about, this, this, it's just, this, this is uh, incredible. So thank you for everybody who's sharing. I think that where we go, so for example, we have an organization called Dedication to Community, and this is at the very foundation of what we talk about, reconciliation. How do we, how do we get to that point of harmony in society, togetherness, connectedness? How do, we, how do we form reconciliation? How do we have that as an outcome? And you have to, you have to first commit to coming to this party with as Justice said, open-mindedness and humility. You have to be willing to learn. And so for those who are seeking the truth and seeking action, seeking a way for um, togetherness, to get to togetherness, we need to, we need to implant in them that you have to put your ego aside. Not necessarily a, a simple process, but open-mindedness and humility is a must. Mm -hmm. And as we, as we go through this process of reconciliation, listening, learning, understanding, acknowledging, acknowledging our history 
how we got here, why we're here, what happened in the history, and then taking action, taking action with that foundation of open-mindedness and humility, and then with pillars of vulnerability, courage, purpose, power, and pain. Vulnerability, we talked about it. Courage, we know this, this, this does take some creative courage. Purpose, what's your why? Power. Everybody on this call has a sense of power. They can do something. Everybody on this call can do something, can create surrogacy in some way so that you're not the only one saying this stuff. Somebody else is saying it for you while you sleep. Mm. Express, and then expressing that pain, expressing that pain, revealing your own pain. And then this is, this is where we need to be embedded. We need to be able to accept other people's pain. We need to be able to accept it. We're all struggling in many ways. We're all challenged. That pain, once we start to accept other people's pain and we're revealing our own together with vulnerability, now we're going to start to connect with people. And that, I think, is a foundation for what we need to do here, what we need to do to understand this toxic masculinity, this history that we've had, how it's formed who we are as a society. I'm, I'm just proud of the organization that I, I'm associated with. That's, that's what we do. We do it in law enforcement contexts a lot. Because if there is ever, has ever been toxic masculinity, it's been in the law enforcement field. Um, you just yeah. look at the numbers. I, I think to have numbers where only 5% of women, 5% uh, of police forces in our industry made up of women, come on, that's ridiculous. 51% of our population is women. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm very much a proponent of getting through that process of reconciliation, but we first must listen and we must listen beautifully in order to start the process. Like, like my esteemed panelists, I feel getting involved and rolling your sleeves up. I'm, I'm at this point I, I teach and every, every semester I get 40, 50 new students that I have an opportunity to somehow influence in a positive way or help, help get to a different place. And I get, we have curriculum we have to get through, but there's personal moments where you can open up and share things. And I also volunteer for Big Brothers and I was paired with two um, brothers, two Jamaican brothers, single mom. And, and I hear a lot of what my panelists were sharing and I see that and I see as an opportunity that I alone can't change it, but I can actually maybe do something to help them change their circumstances. And the beauty of the internet is you can find other like-minded people in your beliefs Facebook groups, there's, you're not alone. I mean, years ago, we didn't have those resources. Some people use them from the wrong way, but I think we can use the technology tools and social media platforms to grow like-minded people in a forward direction and to let people know they're not these islands who are isolated. We can build bridges to all these and link them. And, you know, I think people think like people down South or out West and other countries, they they are different, but really, we're really the same. We have different life challenges, maybe, but a lot of what the core, um, you know, I just got married almost three weeks ago, and my uh, spouse is a former law enforcement Latino, and I understand all the challenges you add in the, you know, the LGBT background, the Latino culture, and law enforcement. There was a lot of moving parts going on there, and I saw him evolve in his life to where he is, and that was a journey, and if everyone could have that arc and just share a little bit, we can all, I think as a society benefit from it, all for the better. Because when you have parts of our society, we, we all know this, that aren't doing well. We see it at our community college. I got homeless students, you know, how they're gonna pay their rent and all this. And they're still going to school, you know, like it shouldn't be that hard for them. There should be more supports, right? We should do, we should do more to help them and we're limited, but there's things we can still do. So that's what I just wanted to add. Mm. Powerful, thank you. All right, anyone else would like to respond to that before we transition to our Q and A? Um, and we're just talking about where the where is the love. So, any resources or supports that should be in place? Um, you know, as as we discuss, you know, uh, positive masculinity, healthy masculinity. Excuse me. 
I think everybody said it all. <laughs> all right. These gentlemen are brilliant. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking notes as well. So you are, are, are providing some good homework and, uh, you know, uh, 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 some some takeaways that, you know, we can go back and and, and apply um, to Could our I work. Add one thing? Go for it. Um, I just would like to add that the conversation is just not just amongst men, right? Yeah. That we are engaging in this conversation because women also are learning the same messages mm -hmm. about what masculinity looks like and mm -hmm. is, right? And in, in some ways we have to bring this, this discussion across, you know, everyone should be having this discussion, right? So it should be at kitchen tables, lunch, lunch chats, work, workshops at jobs. You know what I mean? We should all just be like talking about, you know, what it looks, how things, cause it's easy, it's easy to talk about what needs to change. Mm. It's hard to envision what that change looks like after. So that's what I'm hoping we could build upon, what that change looks like. You know, if I can just jump in for a second with what Justice just said, I mean, you know, because it's been mentioned a couple of times, the term law enforcement, law enforcement. I mean, Black Lives Matter has been around since you know, the last seven, eight years, but it has exploded this year because we saw a white man, a police officer, law enforcement person, need to death a black man, George Floyd, you know, in Minnesota for nine minutes on videotape. Um, we know this is not new. I've been an activist since the 1980s when I was a youth, a teenager. I can't tell you how many protests, marches, rallies I've been a part of over the last 30 plus years uh, because of toxic manhood within the law enforcement throughout the country. This is not some new phenomenon. And so I think to Justice's point about the, the need to change things, part of the problem with law enforcement is that they've been taught, and I have many friends who work in law enforcement, I got many relatives who work in law enforcement, I've consulted with and worked with law enforcement. Violence is the first point of action for everything. Let's be honest about it. Violence, violence, violence is inextricably tied to toxic manhood. And whether you're a black, Latinx, Asian, white police officer, whether you're a male police officer or a female police officer, whether you are straight or queer police officer, actually doesn't matter. What matters is, have you bought into toxic manhood? Has this department, this agency bought into toxic manhood where violence is basically the first definition of toxic manhood? That's the problem. And then if you fought into it, who are mostly likely to be the victims of that toxic manhood? Poor people, people of color, women, you know, the LGBT plus community, immigrant people, we can go on down a list. And so I agree with Justice that this thing needs to change because this is completely outrageous and out of control that this is allowed to exist, you know, from generation to generation. And we know that many of these things are even rooted in, 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 in the slave culture of this country because as the moment the slavery is over, we went from overseers to police forces because there was this need to monitor and control certain communities because they were considered a threat to toxic manhood that was in power. Let's be very honest about it. This is why we need to know American history. Most of us do not know basic American history. This is not some new phenomenon with George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or any of these folks. This has been going on the whole way. You know, they just call them different names. They call them slave catchers. They call them overseers. They call them slave masters. But it was the same mindset, which is toxic manhood rooted in violence to control and dominate people. People are not viewed as human beings, which is why the Constitution to this, still, to this day is still problematic because it still says in the Constitution that Black folks are three-fifths of a human being. Well, that's what the police officer thought when he was kneeing George Floyd to death very casually, stoically. You know, this is three-fifths of a human being. And so where we might have individual relationships, like I have people in my family who are white, Black, Latinx, Asian, I love all people. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your identities are. But to Justice's point, just because of who you might be married to or who you might be friends with or who might be a member of your family, that's your individual relationships. What we're talking about is power. And until you also challenge that, you know what I mean? If you live in Springfield, Massachusetts, I live in New York City, Brooklyn, New York, do you challenge the brutality of the law enforcement in your community towards certain people or toward all people for that matter? Until you challenge that, you're still part of the problem as far as it's concerned, no matter how you identify yourself, no matter how progressive you think you are. 
And so to me, that's what it has to be consistent across the board. I challenge toxic manhood in every space. That would mean including in my household, including who I sleep with is what I'm saying to y'all. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, he's, he's doing a little bit of marketing for us. So December 3rd uh, will be our third part of our series. And we're talking about some of those types of relationships. Um, you brought up the law enforcement, so that will- Oh, they um, brought it up, I'm responding to it. I didn't I, bring it. You, you're it. responding to, yeah, <laughs> my fault. I wanna put that on you. Um, yeah, so, but we'll have some conversation um, and dialogue around um, those relationships with law enforcement and other um, groups in power, um, if you will. So uh, we're gonna transition to our question and answer. Um, I see there are a few um, here. And so we'll try to get to uh, all of them uh, in our time we have remaining. Um, so I invite uh, keep all our panelists, keep your videos on um, as we engage in this um, portion. Um, so we will start with our first question. Hi, everyone. So the first question that we're getting from the audience is, um, my experience working in the tech industry has been very male dominated and my college IT classes have been as well. I identify as a male myself, but I find these male dominated environments tiring, frustrating to work in compared to gender balanced environments where I find it easier to engage. My question is how the panelists stay energized in overly male environments and how they may have gone about moving the needle toward more inclusivity. Mm. May I go first on this one since I teach technology. So, uh -huh. <laughs> um, it is true. Um, currently it is white male oriented. I'm happy to say at STCC we've taken a lot of initiatives to diversify, not as much as I'd like to see, but we're moving the needle. We are trying, but something happened because in the eighties and nineties, when I was in school, there was a lot more women and uh, men of color involved in the uh, tech field. And then something changed, be it, you know, uh, conversation for another time, but you know, they started making things software engineering and not less technology and more engineering, which has barriers to people thinking, I can't do this, I can't do the math and I can't do the sciences. So we have to rebrand that when we talk to students. But I think we need to talk, pull, um, go back to the younger grades and get people interested in technology. And the problem is when you don't see an African American male as a coder, then that, that young male doesn't see someone to aspire to. They don't see someone that can be, I could do that too. And so I think it's our responsibility to go back into the community and get people involved, which we do at the college. In, in the environment, I just, you know, like let's fast forward to the current work environment. I think it's important to diversify your workforce. Our workforce, our technology, our healthcare should mirror the community we live in. People should see themselves when they go into um, like staples and people work in technology. So I think it's important. I think that's all of our responsibility, not just in the tech field, but everywhere that we include, no one is left behind. Everyone feels they can be part of this. So that's what I just wanted to add. Are we all allowed to respond? I thought Quentin looks like he was about to respond. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, it's free game here, go ahead. Go, go. Uh, no, go ahead, Quinn, please, I can wait, I can wait. Okay, I, I, I'll be quick. I think it has a lot to do with just intentionality, um, being deliberate. So when, when, we, when we talk about intentionality, I'm not talking about intentionality in terms of discussion. Uh, we all know that discussion is no longer acceptable with, with these issues. It's all about action. There has to be deliberate action. If if we are going to be intentional, that has to manif manifest as action. Yeah, We've been in these, these conference rooms before where people are talking about, yeah, we need to do this, we need to do that. They're not being strategic in how it's going to be done, how it's going to be executed. So in about another month, things just cycle out. Well, in another year, it doesn't get done. And we're at the same conference table talking about the same issue that has had no execution. That's what I'm saying. 
this has to be deliberate. There has to be a call to action. What is it that you, as an individual, are going to do now, not tomorrow? How are you going to step into it right now? Give it to me right now. I want to know, and then I'm going to hold you accountable for it. In law enforcement, what I tell people, the last question I say is, what are you going to do to change the culture, to be better? You might be great now, but we could all be better. So what are you going to do? And they might say, whatever. They're going to get out of their car a little bit off, and they're gonna, more often. They're going to roll down their window. They're going to have lunch with somebody that they, who they don't even know where they're on patrol. And then I say, okay, now who's the most trusted person in your life as an adult? The most trusted adult you have. And they'll say their mother, their father, their sister, their wife, their husband. And then I say, in front of me right now, I want you to email that person and tell them what you are going to do. What you just told me you're going to do, you need to email it to them because they're going to be the ones to hold you accountable for that action that you said you're going to do. We need to have action and we need to have accountability. If we don't have that, we will continue on this path and the cycle as Kevin talked about, the cycle will continue. In another year, we'll be at the same table talking about what we should be doing. Mm. I mean, Brother Quinton said it all. I mean, as you were talking, um, wow. Um, I kept thinking, uh, sir, uh, Dr. King at the end of his life kept saying we needed a radical revolution of values. And I feel like that's what you're saying. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, and let me make it very clear. Uh, I'm not anti-law enforcement. I'm not anti-police. What I'm anti is toxic manhood. And violence is the first solution for everything. You know, and I'm anti what has happened to my community for the past 400 years in this country. You know, uh, and people having this feeling that nothing's ever going to change. But also anti women feeling left out. I think is, you know, what do we do in a practical way? You know, I know that systemic racism exists, so I make it a point to support black owned businesses in my communities around the country, just like in Brooklyn, New York, where I live, the Hasidic Jewish community supports the Hasidic Jewish community. You know, there's a Chinatown in New York City, the Chinese community supports the Chinese community. I'm not apologetic about it because I understand that certain communities will not be supported financially, economically, if people who look like them don't do it because people don't think about all of us. They just see what they see. But I also, make sure that I support women owned businesses. I make sure that I work with women in all capacities. I make sure if I'm paying a man $20 an hour, I'm paying a woman $20 an hour. You know, it's not this either or thing or I somehow value a male presence or male work more than a woman's work. That's absolutely insane to me. So I agree with uh, brother Quentin that we've got to literally practice what we preach here. Like, you know, I even, I put it to you like this. I go into spaces, I look for diversity in all ways. You know, is it culturally, racially diverse? Is there gender and gender identity diversity? You know what I mean? Um, you know, um, and even if even if, even if folks don't announce who they are, you know what I'm saying? I say it in my speeches, in my walk, my remarks, uh, everything. I don't support racism. I don't support sexism. I don't support homophobia, transphobia, anti-Semitism. I don't support Islamophobia. I don't support anti-immigrant hate. I don't support ableism against the disabled community. I don't support any of these things. You know, I think we have to be, as Gandhi said, the examples that we want to see. Is it hard? Yeah, it's hard, but guess what? You know what? No one said that this, that we wouldn't even be here now having this conversation if it wasn't for folks who came before us who had to push through stuff that was hard. You know, and so I think that we have to make an effort, you know, to say that we need to, because diversity to me also is not just about having, you know, uh, Brian's husband, who's a Latinx cop on the force. That's important. We need Latinx and, and black cops on police forces. We absolutely do. We need women officers on police forces, but we also need to be at the table of power. You know what I mean? Because we know a lot of institutions hire people in the name of diversity, they even hire diversity officers, but ultimately decisions keep going back to the same small handful of folks. And that's where the power dynamic never changes. And I'm saying to y'all, where history is important, we went through this in the 60s and 70s because of the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement and the feminist movement. Certain doors were open. We got access to things. We got more numbers of people. But the reality is in New York City where I live, Yep, we got a lot of black and brown police officers, but the police union is run by a white man, a racist white man, you know, who is the antithesis of what we're talking about. And so that's the issue of it's back to justice's point around power. You know, yo, half the police force could be black and brown, but if the police union are white men 
who participate in toxic manhood and white supremacy and already see us as others. And instead of seeing it as us, then as Quentin said, nothing's ever going to change. So it's actually all connected. And we need people sophisticated enough if they're going to call themselves leaders. Brother Brian's a leader. He's in a classroom. That makes you a leader. You know what Brother Quentin does? He's a leader. What J Justice does? He's a leader. If you're a leader, we have a responsibility to be able to connect all the dots together because most people ain't doing it. We got to do it. We got to show people that any of this is actually detrimental to the entire country and the entire human race. We do it with love, but we still have to say it. I wanted to jump on something that uh, stuck in my mind is that we don't think about everybody. You yeah. just said that. We don't think about everybody. So I want us to recognize how we are defining inclusion and what that looks like, right? The reality is, is that we don't all define inclusion the same way, especially if it doesn't change or affect our own personal lives yeah. as much, if it's not as significant, you know? And I think about, I, I really think about, so what does that mean when we're creating these spaces? I think about history, much like you said, and I think about our fear of not knowing, mm. right? And why do I say that? Because I don't really believe in, in the police system. I don't believe in that. That system was created just like to oversee us. We are still seen as the product. We are not valued as a human being, right? And so that's systemic. That is systemic. We are seeing the, and because it's systemic, they can use our bodies for whatever they want. We can use our bodies. They got this pandemic. They can shoot it all up with whatever they want hmm. so that everybody else and that 1% is healthy. How the heck is the <laughs> president still healthy from this daggone pandemic? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just going, no. I'm just going to say, I feel like his whole time, he was just like, I want the flu. Someone kissed me with the flu. He, now he's got it. And it just, it speaks truth to power, right? It speaks like what is power and what, what does that look like in the lives of the other, wow. right? In the lives of the other, they are dying at a tremendous rate. In the lives of the other, we are being lied about, talked about, we don't even navigate with each other in the same ways because we hate each other because of what we've learned from each other, right? So on and on and on this cycle. So what does inclusion mean? Mm. It means that we are continually doing the work on ourselves. We are rocking the very foundation that was built under us and we are cracking that. And we are allowing new ideas, new experiences to fill our lives. We are embracing that. That's right. We are understanding and recognizing that the person next to us is just as important as I. And if I have to say Black Lives Matter, it doesn't. And what do we do together to ensure that it does? Because mm. I'm tired of your billboards. I am tired of you crying next to me when I go to a Black Lives Matter rally. I am tired. But what I would like to see is a foundation framed on love and not fearing what's unknown because right. what we have now is not working. Right? right? When everything was all rocky and everybody was like, oh, Black Lives Matter and shit was all shifting. We got the fucking pandemic. And people was like, I'm going to give to black businesses. I'm going to love black people. Black Lives Matter, that shit lasted for about three weeks. Huh. And then we was right back to what? Huh. Normal. Black lives don't matter if I have to say it out loud for someone to hear. Because no one's going around. And I don't care that white lives matter because we understand that. We recognize that. We were taught that. If we internalize that. That's why you don't have to say white lives matter because it has already been reinforced in our very spiritual practices. 
Our spiritual practices, which should be rooted in who we are, is rooted in whiteness and white ideas and white toxins and white hate. So what I would like to see is more love, <laughs> more us tapping into, right? And being active with that, actively letting go of our ego, actively taking less space as a man and more space as ourselves, right? Less space as a man in this, this society, what this society has fed us as of who we should be and more space as exactly who we are, right? And so I'm gonna end with that all because right. I feel like Kevin be blowing things up. So I'm just gonna pass it to no. whoever's gonna touch it. So we have, we, we have a couple more questions we wanna try to get to uh, before we close. Um, Benetta, the next question. Okay, so the next one is, what do the panelists think is more important for women who are raising boys to know to help them have healthy mindset as they grow into their manhood? And do you all need to hear that again or you got it? Sorry. <laughs> give, 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 it to, give it to us one more time. Okay. All right. I'll, you want me to read it for you? Yeah, go ahead. All right, I got you. So it says, what do the panelists think is important for women who are raising boys to know in order to help them have a healthy mindset as they grow into manhood? That, that's a good one. I, I, I think the, the theme is so obvious here. <laughs> we have a theme and it's, it comes down to one word and that one word is love. It's okay to be loved. Yeah. It's 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 required to be loved, and it's mm -hmm. required to love. It's very simple. We don't necessarily treat uh, teach our boys the same way we teach our girls with respect to love, and love for some boys is a weak a weakened position. Yeah, but it's really like vulnerability. It's a strength. It's a strength. It's the strength. It's the ultimate, the ultimate strength that a human being can have is the ability to love and to accept love mm. and to love oneself. Wow. Thank you. I want to add to that, um, and I'll be real quick this time. Don't allow uh, your gender be based on color, blue or pink. Yeah. allow the full spectrum to exist as we build relationships with each other. Hmm. Yeah. All right. All we need is love. I think that, that, that wraps, oh, Brian, you had something? No, nope, I agree. I don't want to. Hundred percent. Okay. Love. Love right. can take care of a lot of things. Excellent, excellent. So, I I want to thank you uh, all for being here today. Um, we will have uh, Cindy Brunick come back on to close us out, uh, close out our session. But I I thank you all so much um, for all the information you provided, your transparency and um, willingness to share. Uh, today um, with myself, with our audience, um, our Springfield community, um, and beyond. Um, you know, I, I know we had some folks from other states um, who found it important uh, for, you know, to, to hear this, um, you know, this kickoff for the series. Um, so uh, thank you all uh, very much um, and hope, you know, we have the opportunity to connect again and, you know, learn more from one another and share. Um, so I'll hand it back to uh, Cindy uh, to close it out. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I just want to take a moment to just pause.
Um, I feel like part of the cycle, um, I don't know about everyone else, but I just feel like, yes, you may have another banana. One of my, uh, the children that I have blessed to try to raise in a healthy way is asking me for food. So um, I feel like, I don't know if anyone else can relate to this, but just like this current moment, you know, that you all have laid out um, so poignantly, so uh, in a complex and nuanced way, part of it is like being on this hamster wheel, like go, 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 don't pause, don't think, don't reflect, don't take care of yourself, don't, um, that's at least how life feels to me right now. And so as we close out this event, I just want to like, take a moment to say thank you. <laughs> um, and just uh, for each and every one of us to, a lot of times uh, uh, something I learned as a way to just close out a space is like sharing like one word, <laughs> one word that you're taking um, in your heart, in your body, in your spirit, in, um, you know, from this, this, what we've just shared together. And so if people wanna type in the chat, I believe our attendees might only be able to type to the panelists, but if you wanna share one word in the chat, um, and I invite our panelists, our host, our moderator um, to share one word in the chat as well. How many bananas have I had today? Josiah's asking me, how many bananas have I had today? You've had four. <laughs> so, um, uh, so just share, one word or more, um, you know, share what's on your heart, your mind in the chat as we close, including that one. Yes. Um, and, uh, and I'm just going to uh, just say again, my gratitude. Um, what I'm taking is just like feeling that my foundation shifting. So thank you, Justice. And thank you, panelists. My foundations are shifting as a result um, of this dialogue today and what each of you brought to it. Um, we want your feedback. So folks who are attendees today, you're going to be getting just a really simple Google survey as a follow up through the zoom itself. Um, tell us what you're taking. Tell us what you liked, what you'd like to see in the future. We have another event um, and that is coming. Well, two more events, but the next one is November 12th at 2 p.m. And um, the event is uh, going to be a take, uh, you know, build upon what we've started today with a little um, a different angle, which is a, talking about fatherhood, um, how folks may have experienced it and or how um, uh, folks are showing up to this role as fathers and mm. weaving in questions of gender stereotypes yeah. and breaking cycles of violence, really building healthy relationships in the home and in our intimate relationships in the home. Yeah. And um, you can visit the Heart of the Man webpage to register, spread the word, tell your, you know, tell people what you got from today and let's get, bring another folk, uh, another person in to our next event. Um, thank you all so much. Um, have a wonderful day and um, we'll be seeing each other again soon. Thank you. Springfield Technical Community College, SD.